to the second part of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, good morning, uh, everybody. My name is Koen van Doorslag, and together with uh, Alessandro, who will give the second part of this presentation, I will uh, explain our uh, Hydrolab project. It's about uh, wave impacts on a stone wall, which are caused by wave overtopping. And this um, project was carried out at UPC in Barcelona, and uh, Ivan Caceres, he uh, was very active in this uh, project as well. Um, first, I'll introduce our, um, our project, and I will tell you why exactly we did it. Then I will explain the experimental setup before I pass the word to Alessandro about the data analysis and some uh, conclusions. Um, well, first of all, the part about the wave overtopping, waves overtopping a dike or a key wall, that's well known. Uh, it has been studied in, in many international uh, funded projects, um, and it led to the Eurotop manual. So it's, it's quite um, well known to quantify wave overtopping. Now we are looking one step uh, further. We are, um, we are having a look at what happens next. So the water that overtopped a dike, it still can cause some uh, impacts on buildings and so on. But to quantify that, at the moment, theoretical formula didn't really exist. Um, so we carried out some small-scale tests um, before, and this Hydralab project did some large-scale tests. And then we uh, well, both, of course, have uh, advantages and disadvantages, and I will explain a little bit later. But first, I would like to show this um, nice photo of uh, the city of Ostend in Belgium. It's a picture of about 10 years ago. Um, nowadays, they have um, here the beaches uh, has been nourished, so the, the waves are being pushed away from the dikes. But let's say 10 years ago, during every winter storm, water here could overtop uh, the sea dike. And then the question was, what happens here at the end of this uh, dike? Also inside the harbor, you see some white capping. So you see um, some water, which is here overtopping the key wall. And then it can impact this stone wall, but we don't really know with what kind of force. This is a holiday picture I took in uh, Vietnam, so you see that the problem is not only uh, along the Belgian coast, but of course it's a worldwide problem. Solutions can be like this, where um, at the location where the bike uh, is, there's a, a permanent storm wall, but there can also be some um, mobile storm walls which are being set up at the moment of storm. Um, but before we try to uh, calculate the anchoring forces, we of course need to know what kind of impact these overtopping wave creates on this storm wall. Um, well, a quick word about the physical process. You see a wave here which is overtopping the dike. It's traveling along the promenade and then it's impacting on the storm wall. It's also reflecting. Uh, there can be a residual water layer in front of the storm wall. There can also be no residual water layer. Um, the next incoming wave can be, hin uh, can be influenced by the reflective um, bore from the storm wall, and so on. So you see, it's quite a complicated process. Um, and at that time, theoretical formula didn't really exist. So we, uh, we carried out some experiments. Um, the data we already have are partly from some small-scale tests, tests carried out at uh, Ghent University at a scale 1 in 20. We measured here the wave spectrum. Well, here uh, in the flume, we measured the wave spectrum. And secondly, we measured the wave impact here on this storm wall and on this storm wall. Um, we could find a relationship between the wave spectrum and the wave impact, but we did not know anything about what happened here on the promenade. Uh, flow depth, flow velocity of the bore are unknown. Second uh, problem for the small scale tests is the, the possible scale effect. Um, and we also noticed some resonance of the storm, the vibrating storm wall under the impact so the, sometimes the wave recording or the impact recording was uh, influenced by that. Um, we partly did some tests, a uh, very short uh, test campaign with the wave overtopping simulator of Fientje van der Meer. Normally, this overtopping simulator is being put on top of a dike. Water is released, and they test the stability of the uh, inner slope of, of the dike, of the grass dike. 
In our case, we, we used this overtopping simulator. We built a horizontal promenade in front of it, where we could measure here with the surfboards the flow depth and the flow velocity. And we measured the wave impact here at these two kind of stone walls. It was a really nice uh, experiment, but um, it's, it was one overtopping wave which created one impact. So there was no relationship with the wave spectrum at, uh, at, the, at the sea, um, in which we were, of course, also interested. Then uh, a third test campaign before this Hydrilab project was in, uh, carried out in Hanover in the Grosser Wellen Canal. Um, all of a sudden, I received a phone call from Stefan Schimmels to say that there was a dike which was close to the configuration we were interested in. We had this really nice opportunity to do some tests. Um, but of course, this, desk, this dike was not built exactly for our purpose. So the crest was a little bit higher than what we wanted. But at least it was a nice opportunity to do a really short time of, uh, of testing. And for some reasons, we could only test also quite short time series. So this means that we were unsure of the uh, statistics of the wave spectrum and so on. We could also not measure wave overtopping over the storm walls. Therefore, we submitted this HydroLab project. Um, so we tried to optimize the configuration of the dike. And mainly, we've, we tried to find the link between the wave spectrum at the sea, the overtopping bore, the flow depth, flow velocity at the promenade, and then the wave impacts, and possibly also the post overtop or the second order overtopping over these storm walls. If possible, we would also like to investigate the shape of the, of the impacts and the, the resonance or scale effects and possibly quantify them. So we did some tests, scale 1 and 6 in UPC. The dike was a little bit lower. The water level was a little bit higher. We tested time series of uh, 1,000 waves. We focused a bit more on the flow velocities and the flow depths on the uh, promenade. We measured um, with high frequencies the impact forces and also the wave overtopping over this storm wall. So I already mentioned uh, the wave flume of UPC, 100 meter length, and more or less here was the location where we had our uh, dike and or key wall. First con uh, configuration was a key wall. It was overtopped. Then here at the end, we had the storm wall. The overtopping water was flowing into some overtopping tank. The second um, configuration we had was we changed the key wall into a sloping dike with a slope one and three. Um, just, just a picture of the construction work. It just shows that yeah, a large scale uh, experiments consider quite some manpower and, and it takes um, heavy lifting and so on to get everything in position. In the overtopping tank, um, we had here some pressure sensors. We had two pumps and as soon as the water level in the, the overtopping tank was too large, water was being distracted. It passed by this electromagnetic flow meter here, so we could know how much water we took uh, out of the overtopping tank. We had 12 uh, wave gauges and some pressure sensors in front of the structure to measure the um, wave heights and wave periods and everything. Um, on, the promenade, on the promenade, we have um, some acoustic wave gauges and some velocity uh, meters. These are the storm walls with, on the left here, four force sensors. On the right, pressure sensors. Um, this is, again, some pictures of the setup. But I will show this short movie of the experiments, and then Alessandro will say something about the uh, analysis. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Alessandro Romano from the University of Roma 3. I would like to present very quickly the pre preliminary result of this experiment. Uh, but first of all, the, the, the analysis is still ongoing, but uh, we, I would like to show the methodology of the data analysis, also to have a useful comment and suggestion from uh, the audience. But uh, first of all, the experimental condition, we uh, used three water levels. 2.39 meter, 2.72, and 2.55 meters. The wave height it varies between 0.17 meters up to 0.15 meters, and the waves can be classified according to the Eurotop manual as non-breaking waves, and uh, the period 
are shown as well. So the pre surface elevation in the wave flume was being <coughs> measured by the uh, resistive wave gauges uh, that are 12 placed along the wave flume, and we used the free surface elevation time series in order to assess the wave parameter into the flume. So both the Goda Suzuki reflection analysis and Mansard Funk analysis have been carried out in order to separate the incident from the reflected wave components. And furthermore, we uh, did also a time domain reflection analysis based on the paper of Frigart and Bronzer in order to have the incident free surface elevation in front of the structures. For what concerns the wave topping, which is a secondary goal of the experiment, uh, this is just an example of the signal measured into the overtopping tank. Uh, in this case, it is very simple to uh, obtain the overtopping volume because it's just the volume inside the tank. But in few tests, when the volume in, into the tank is not enough, uh, like in this case, the water level increases too much and two pumps have been activated in order to extract the volume, the water, from the overtopping tank and to refill the wave flume. So in this case, the overtopping volume is not so easy, it's easy but <laughs> not as in the previous case, uh, and is given by the volume into the overtopping tank and the integral of the uh, discharge measured by the over, uh, electromagnetic flow meter. This is just an example of the acoustic wave gauges, so the signals measured by the acoustic wave gauges placed on the top of the, of the promenade that, according to the measurements of the acoustic doppler velocimeters, I apologize, but this part is uh, still ongoing, so we are working on analyzing this data. But this part will be very important to uh, feel, the, to identify the relationship between the impacts, the bore, so the characteristics of the flow and depth velocity on the promenade, and, and the wave parameters, the boundary wave parameters. The analysis so far, we uh, focused on the analysis of the pressure and forces. This is an example of the um, signals measured by the three pressure sensors placed on the plate of the stone wall. As you can see, and we will see briefly, there is, uh, there is a lot of noise, uh, a lot of spikes in the signals, and this is an example of the load cells measurements, so the load cells placed at the vertices of the plate. But, first of all, in order to assess if the forces and pressure measurements are reliable, we compare the direct force measurements with the uh, forces obtained by the uh, pressure. Okay, we have to. Okay. So, but as I told you, there is uh, there are few spikes in the pressure sensors in the pressure signals. So uh, we develop, developed an algorithm to uh, clean the signal, and after that we can compare the we can compare the direct force measurement against the forces obtained by the integration of the pressures. And as you can see, the results are quite in a good agreement, both for the shape and for the peak values. But after that, we analyzed the signals of the force measurement in order to detect each single impact that occurred at the storm wall. So an algorithm uh, has been developed in order to obtain both the peak values and the starting point and the beginning and the starting point and the final point of each event. We think that this is important because in the future we will perform a detailed analysis of the shape of the event that as you can see is not always a church roof type impact. After that we are working on the statistical analysis of the forces. We would like to know if a probability density function can be used to describe statistically the behavior of the impacts at the storm wall. So in this plot, we are comparing the empirical quantiles versus the theoretical quantiles of several probability density functions. And in this case, it appears, at least for the key wall and at least for the preliminary results, that few probability density functions can be used to describe statistically the, the impacts. And we think that this can be important in order to provide a predicting formulae or a predicting methodology to design such kind of world. Just to slide more, we are now facing the problem to identify a relationship between the 
statistical parameter of the force and the weight parameter into the flume. Uh, in this case, we are just looking at the relationship between the measured data against with the dimensionless uh, parameter, RC over HS, and now, currently, we are analyzing the relationship in its dimensionless form. But, as you can see, the classical uh, um, dimensionless parameter, rho g um, forces 1 over uh, <coughs> 250 divided by rho g and square h, is not so robust to describe the, the, the data. And we found a good relationship, indeed, uh, by using um, the dimensionless parameter, which is F1 over 250, divided by rho g rc, which is the total aid of the storm wall, squared. So if you have suggestions or uh, comments on this, please, uh, we will be very happy to hear. So um, just to conclude, this experiment, we think that uh, provided a quite good look at the overtopping process. Of course, the analysis is still ongoing, but uh, as Ivan can say, there are a lot of data and uh, it's not exactly easy to analyze that. But in the future, uh, uh, we think that we can provide the missing, li missing link between the small scale experiment and the overtopping test simulator in order to provide a methodology or a predicting formula for designing this kind of structure. And thanks for your attention. Thanks, Alessandro. Is there any question, please? please. No, I was wondering, uh, the, the large scale tests are not prototype scale yet, so there's a scale part yet, so I was wondering what are the remaining scale effects you uh, expect no. to go to the full scale? No, um, it was a mistake of mine because the, I was thinking to that experiment, because in this case is large scale experiment, at least prototype experiment, but this is not wave. So we have uh, measurements, or they have measurements of velocity of the flow and impact, but you cannot relate directly this velocity and this impact to our wave condition. So our experiment, I think the idea is in the small scale test, you have a lot of information and relationship between wave conditions and impact. But there is a lack of the features of the flow on the promenade. In this case, you have a lot of uh, data on the flow depth and flow velocity and on the impacts, but there is not a relationship between the waves. In our experiment, we think that we can merge the knowledge or the data that have been carried out so far in order to use both the small scale data and the large scale. Are there some differences between this setup and uh, the real? Yes, of course, but uh, yes, you're right. <laughs> uh, maybe one, one more question. Uh, I was missing in your formula for the forces the distance between the crest wall and the. Uh, uh, we, it's a 10 meter distance, um, while well, prototype 10 meter distance. So with the simulated for of the engine on the main 10 meter, small scale, um, half a meter, so. Still one in twenty. It always refers to prototype uh, ten meter. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other question?